Okay, welcome. Uh, I know almost everybody in the room, but for those of you I've not said hello to or met, my name is Scott Myers, and uh, my wife Kathy's right there in the back wearing a dark t-shirt. Uh, I've been a vet here, well, I've been a vet for 38 years, and I've been in Granbury for 32 years. So, right about the same time, I started sculpting. So, it's kind of interesting how that happened. You want me to smile more or talk? <laughs> 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 okay, let me shut the door. Maybe that. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> Okay, so if I need to speak louder, do the thumbs up and I'll go whoop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will try to speak louder. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. There's always a question of how did a veterinarian in Granbury, Texas start working for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So I'll kind of tell you the story a little bit, and then anytime anybody has a question or whatever, let me know and I'll answer it. But I'll also tell you all who all the players are, and we'll just do that right now. Um, over here, this is Drew Pearson that played for the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, he's got great stories about how he wanted his afro. <laughs> This is Bryant Young, and Bryant Young was my, my member that just went in two years ago, class of 2022, played for the 49ers. If any of you have an opportunity, it takes 10 minutes, go to YouTube and type in Bryant Young induction speech. He was the star of the show. He stole the whole show. It's a really sad story, but he's very powerful in that he has six children, and one of his child, children of died at 15 with a brain tumor. And he tells that story, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. It, he's an amazing individual. And he told me, he said, I don't know how I got in the Hall of Fame. I'm quiet, I'm not a showboat, I did my job, I did my minimum of interviews I was supposed to do, and he's just one of those good people that good things happen to, and he got to where he needs to be. By the way, offensive lineman, he was a defensive lineman, offensive lineman that played against him, literally called the Hall of Fame and said, this guy needs to be in. So that's pretty impressive. Um, that is Charles Haley. And he played for the Dallas Cowboys and the San Francisco 49ers. Every time he sees Kathy, he picks her up. <laughs> and dangles her feet. <laughs> He's really an interesting guy. The guy in there, that's Kevin Green. He played for several teams, mostly the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he had the long flowing hair. And he wanted it. He told me, he said, I want it all the way hanging off the back, and I just want the G and the E on my name to show. Well, the Hall of Fame wouldn't let me do that, so I had to cut it off back here. Okay. And, and I, I actually owned the record for the longest hair in the Hall of Fame until Troy Palomalu went in. He beat me. So, okay. Uh, remember the Cowboys? They started using computers and all that. This is Gil Brandt. Yeah. And he's the guy that started all that drafting, and he drafted almost everybody that you knew. Um, he's the, also the guy that told Jerry Jones that he had a lot to learn. I thought that was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do you remember the Hogs when we played the Redskins yeah. and that's yeah. Joe Gibbs teams? This is Bobby Beathard, and he's the mastermind. He's the general manager that put those teams together. Okay, some of you remember LSU back in the 60s when they won the national championship. I'm pretty sure Billy Cannon played on that team, but I'm not there. This is Johnny Robinson. He was on that team as well. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs. He won a Super Bowl, and he was one of the all decade mid players of the yeah. 60s. So it's interesting, some of these older guys that were, I mean, he looked like a movie star, man. I couldn't believe him. I was like, good lord. Um, how they forgot him, I don't know. But luckily, the Hall of Fame is trying to catch up on all the older members. Uh, Cliff Harris. Yeah, okay. And it's funny to me how he told me, he said, you know, he played with Charlie Waters. And I, all I remember when I was a kid is you'd say Charlie Waters and all the girls would swoon. And he said, man, that made me mad. <laughs> he rubbed his bald head and he said, I just put a lick on him. You know, so he's a hitter. If you go back and look at his films. This is Bobby Dillon. Bobby Dillon's last year in the NFL was Vince Lombardi's first year. And he played for the Green Bay Packers. And 
he was, after football, he went on, is it, I think it's Belton, where he was the CEO, he's passed now, but he was the CEO of Wilson Art for years and years. That is an interesting guy. What was his name? Uh, Bobby Dillon. And he only had one eye. I, yeah, I know. I, I know. Yeah, and I'm just play a record ball. Right? Okay, well. One eye, a record ball. And he booked me. <laughs> well, his, his family, everyone I dealt with to get their photos, just the most wonderful people. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah. He passed away eight months before he got in. Oh. Uh, this is Robert Brazil, and Robert Brazil played for the Love Him Blue Oilers back in the day. Um, you know, with those guys. Remember all those guys? And then that's Ladanian Tomlinson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he played for DCU. Yeah. 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 And also the San Diego Chargers and New York Jets. Went to high school too. That's correct. That's correct. So I've done 25. This is 11 of them. And I just thought we'd get a, kind of get a random sampling. So back to how I got involved with it. Um, I was the class artist as a kid, you know, there was that one dude over there drawing. And so I always enjoyed art, but I never could afford really oil paints or anything. So I did pencil drawings and I did pastel drawings. And I learned how to make limited edition prints. So I would sell the original. And you gotta remember, this was in the late 70s, early 80s. So the Texas oil and gas was booming. Running horses and cattle were expensive, and people were buying Western art like it was nobody's business. So I could do a drawing uh, back then, you know, colored and so forth, $3,000 sale. And that, remember, my tra I lived in a trailer and my rent was $65 a month, and that included the water. So $3,000 was a fortune. But I would take that $3,000 and print 400 copies and make a limited edition. I'd sell those copies for 75 bucks a piece. And that's how I made my living. And I actually had to take a pay cut to be a vet. <laughs> anyway, it was a good living and that's how I did it. All that time though, I wanted to be a sculptor, always. And I couldn't afford it because you sculpt something and then what do you have to do? You have to make a mold. And then after you make a mold, you have to cast a bronze. Well, something about this big, back in the day was a $300 mold and a $300 bronze. $600 was out of the question. Uh, in the late 80s, I went through some personal challenges and I just said, you know what, now's the time. I'm gonna become a sculptor. So I took classes from a, a man over in Dallas and we'd meet once a week with a group of people and I began to kind of learn about the world of sculpture. And so I always said, you know, if it's surgery or veterinary medicine or whatever, if you wanna be the very best, go get the best. So there was a man named Edward Froughton He's still alive, and Ed's maybe the world's greatest sculptor, but he's certainly the best in the United States. And I wanted to learn from Edward Froughton. Well, Ed quit, just about quit teaching at that time. But he had a student named Blair Buswell, and Blair Buswell had just started working for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. <laughs> and so Buswell had been doing work for about five years. So I studied with Buswell for 12 years before I got a shot. And about that time, you gotta remember, he's working, I'm working. The Hall of Fame said, we would like to improve the quality of our bus, and they asked Buzzwell to be the supervisor. So he went out and he took all of his sculpture friends and said, how about you try ahead? And then we sort of auditioned. And I said, you mean you want me to help you with the head? And he's like, no, start to finish, it's your deal. Said, okay, so I did ahead of Elvin Bethay for the Houston Oilers, and I'll never forget, I was in his kitchen, and I was sculpting away on his head, and he goes, how many of these have you done? <laughs> <laughs> You're my first one. <laughs> anyway, so then I had to wait three years to get another audition, and I did uh, Rayfield Wright for the Cowboys, and then after that, it became a steady deal, and so the way this works is it's part art, and it's part business, so you call somebody, first of all, these are celebrities, all right? Most of them don't even answer their phone. And then you call them and you go, hi, I'm from Granbury, and they're like, and I'm gonna do your bus for the Hall of Fame, okay? Now, when you had one or two, that was even a bigger uphill climb. Uh, so I brought this, if anybody's interested, uh, if you wanna go deeper into it, oh, Lordy, Rich, we just lost it. Oh. <laughs> Give me a second. We work forever to get this thing pulled up. Um, I have a website, okay? And if you type in scottmyerstudio.com, 
if you enter, if you're interested, and then you hit sculptures, then it says Pro Football Hall of Fame, and it's supposed to show you. <laughs> oh well, there's a picture of every single head. When you touch that head, it'll take you to scenes of the player when he came to Grand Prix. And it tells you every little detail you want to know. Yeah. Sorry about my Wi-Fi here. Anyway, uh, but it's one of those things where you call them and you get these photographs of them. Now, has anybody ever seen a photo of themselves that you thought looked like you? I mean, <laughs> I mean, to make matters worse, if you know anything about photography, if you get too close to a person, it blows out their nose and makes their head look elongated. Well, I'm really into heads, so that I'm gonna, you know, I think that's what you look like, and it's not what you look like. The other thing is, everything in the NFL is all sort of brother-in-law in, you know, seniority and who knows what. So the photographer for the Hall of Fame is about this tall. And he shoots up at this tall. <laughs> Where's the Bible? I'm not kidding you. Every year, my pictures are right up their nose. <laughs> so you get, you get you know, the chef later. I've asked him to. He won't do it. <laughs> that one was even worse. So they give you a front, a side, side, and three quarters, and a back, and that's it. So you get these photos, and you're supposed to build the head of the player from those photographs. Now they measure them, and they have all these measurements from the top, tip of the chin to the back of the head, from the ear hole to the tip of the nose, all these things. And you would think, well, that, that's easy. Man, you can get so lost. <laughs> but, so I build the head off the measurements and these stupid photographs, and then I go to the airport, and I pick them up. And I'm like, hello, I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> It looks nothing like They're not taking an hour and 20 minutes driving to Granbury telling them how much it doesn't look like. <laughs> so my beautiful wife fixed that problem for me. We were like, well, when Robert Brazil came to Granbury, which, by the way, he's going to eat. He, Kathy always feeds him. And she brought all this food, and I was like, oh, my God, who's that for? You know, is that all I know? That was just Robert's. He ate every bit of it. But anyway, he looked at it, and he said, oh, it looks just like me. From the, and he just said, it looks just like me. Well, from the front, it was fine. But the depth was all wrong. So they measured him incorrectly. So I spent three sweaty hours cutting his ears and cutting in clay and moving his nose. And it was horrible. I, I was miserable. The whole time he's on his phone FaceTiming, going, What do you think? And he's all <laughs> Well, your nose looks too big. Oh. <laughs> so I told Kathy, I said, We're never doing that again. So the next year, we went to Johnny Robinson's house in Louisiana. We drove all the way. And when, uh, well, what's the name of which was town? Monroe. Yeah, we went to Monroe, Louisiana. There's Johnny. Johnny's like 86. And we remeasured him. And we've re-photographed him, and I was even with his head, not shooting up. <laughs> and then I said, not only that, well, what, what do you want to look like? You know, do you want to look like you were 30? Do you want to look like when you were 25? And they pick a picture. So he picked a picture, and I thought it was so funny, the whole family goes, get the movie star picture, get the movie star picture. <laughs> and there was this one shot, and I was like, it kind of does. So we used that photo. So I then was different this time, because I'd already met Johnny, and I knew where we were going. So I built his head from meeting him in the beginning instead of these random cold heads. Then Johnny drove to Texas. We remeasured him, checked him, and made him look even more youthful. And that's why we've done it ever since. So it takes an extra trip. And luckily, Gil Brandt lives in Dallas. Um, but the rest of them, you just kind of have to figure out how to get to them. But it's a measure of, of you know the, all these shapes and sizes. But then you have to convince the player that, yes, you're 86 years old. How do you want to look? Okay. All right. Everybody wants to be smiling. No smiling. They weren't Sunday school teachers, okay? They <laughs> I want them looking tough. I want them looking intense, you know, like uh, all that. The other thing is the Hall of Fame photographs, so they're happy as they can be, right? They just got in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so I go, okay, show me that look you want, and they hold it, and then I photograph them all the way around their head. So then I take my iPad, and I used to pin all these photos up on the wall, and I'd have to move my stand around to look at each photo. Now I just take my iPad and just slide photo to photo, and you, you sculpt all the way around their head. The other thing is, 
You want them to pick a look that they look like that fans recognize, okay? Like Drew Pearson had a big afro and a beard, okay? Great, but I'll have a player that played 17 years and they'll say, I, I want a mustache. And I'm like, I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, one year I had a mustache. I'm like, no, dude, you can't have one. We don't remember you with a mustache, you know? Or I shaved my head one year. I'm like, no. So you have to get them the, that iconic look. <laughs> and then, so what a fan goes through, and they go through in huge numbers of people. It's just like cattle getting moved through these things. And they can go, oh, look, there's Drew Pearson. That's what you want from 10 foot away, not when you get up on it. So we talk to them, we get them to pick the what they want, the head, you know, look, they come in. Kathy has been so, so helpful because I picked this guy up at the airport. I tell him it doesn't look like him. I drive him to the studio, and for years, when it was, our house was in, the, we had a studio in our backyard. I would call her, and I would go, it's a true story. <laughs> I would go, hey, we're going through Crescent. Okay, good. we'll see you when you get here. She popped the chocolate chip cookies in the oven. <laughs> We opened the door and the house smelled like cookies. And I'm like, oh yeah, what? You know? And, and I'm not kidding you, she had a feast laid out. So one of the original hogs was Russ Grimm. I don't know if y'all remember yeah, yeah. him. And he's a blue collar dude, man. Yeah. By the way, I took him to dinner. He buys two beers at once. Always. He drinks two. Anyway. So he had me laid out his food. And he came in and his bus was over there and I pulled the sack off of it and he and he was getting his dinner or his lunch and he goes, uh, oh, looks good, just put some hair on it. <laughs> so, well, I'm not kidding you, the food makes the world a difference. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Buzzwell, I worked with him and there's all these little things you want to do. I made the cut and then I've been doing one to two heads a year. Uh, there's three people that do them in the United States. Two of them are full-time sculptors. So I, there, there's about 29 to 30,000 guys have gone through the NFL. And of those, 362 made the Hall of Fame. Wow. It's pretty impressive. Um, I've done 25, and even I was at a but I think that's 6.9%. So 7%. <laughs> so that's pretty impressive to me to be able to say, you know, I got a little piece of that. But what's really cool is, that they'll take care of those heads forever. They'll maintain them, they'll keep them clean, they'll keep them polished. And if, if you, is any, anybody been to the Hall of Fame? Okay. Those who've been there, that room is like a cathedral. It is. It's dark, they illuminate them from below, and so they glow, mm -hmm. and the, everything's reflective. And so they just have this really, really honored feeling about them. And then they have each class, 22, 21, it's really, really neat. So to think about having 25 pieces that my grandkids or don't have any, but when they get or something, <laughs> future could look good look at it. it. Makes me really <coughs> feel cool about it. Uh, I know I'm rambling. But anybody have any questions so far? Did you have one that was the hardest to do? Um, yes. Yeah. I think that some people are easier to sculpt than others. <laughs> and here's an example. I didn't do it, but John Madden would be easy. He's like a caricature, okay? Mm -hmm. Versus um, Brett Favre would be very difficult. I didn't do him either, but he's got very, very simple features. Mm -hmm. So he would be, because you need landmarks. Um, Gil Brandt was easy, <laughs> okay? He's got very distinct, defend, you know, defined features. Um, Charles Haley was also relatively easy. So uh, I guess LT gave me the most trouble. Okay. LT's head was absolutely square. From width to jaw, I mean, it's just a block. And but he was one of the nicest guys. So we called him and you know, said, Kathy wants to get you some dinner. And so he ordered his lunch, whatever he wanted, and all that stuff. And so he sat in the chair and he said, Hey, LT, you want to take a break? No, I'm good. I said, Would you like something to eat? No, I'm good. Something to drink? No. And I said, I need two hours because he was chop chop. And but nice about it. And so I said, Can I have? 15 more minutes? Oh yeah, you're good. And so I got my 15, I even set a timer because I want to be very respectful of his time. And when it went off, he goes, you got what you need? And I was like, yeah, he goes, okay. And he got out of the chair. <laughs> I mean, he just was all about the business. These guys will tell you, and the thing about Hall of Famers is, and I, I say this, is how they carry themselves. It's how they approach things. They approach life differently. I mean, they really are disciplined. 
They learned, you know, Rayfield Wright told me I had to learn to work within the system. But as a rule, most of them are incredibly polite. They're incredibly disciplined. Um, they, they, you know, think about it. all those players went through and only 1% got in. So they were rule followers. They were people that knew what to show, to show up on time and, and, and just go down the list. But as a rule, they're always great, great people to be around. Yes, sir. I came in with a light. Who's the second guy? Right here? Yeah. Bryant Young. He played for the San Francisco 49ers, and he was my 2022 player. He was a defensive lineman. Yep. So just to show you a little funny thing about the the Hall of Fame always tries to keep it fresh. So this year, when a player was told they got in, they sent a former teammate to let them know. So they had a video of Charles Haley walking up to Bryant Young's house in Charlotte, North Carolina. You can find this on YouTube if you want. Knocking on the door, Brian opens the door, and the second he sees Charles Haley wearing a gold coat, he's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, they hug it out, the whole deal. So then Charles, he's like the ultimate goofball trickster. So Charles is walking him with his arm around him out of the backyard, and right when he gets to the pool, Charles pushes him in the pool. <laughs> so Brian Young comes out of the pool like this, and then it says they freeze frame and said, Welcome to the Hall of Fame. So I asked him about that, and he said, well, there's a story. When Bryant Young was a rookie, Charles Haley was on the team, and rookies bring breakfast. Well, he overslept, and he, Bryant Young forgot to bring breakfast. Well, they were all mad, and they said, Rook, you know, don't do that again, or you have to pay for it. So he overslept again and forgot <laughs> breakfast. And Charles Haley and eight other grown men tried to take him down the hall and put him in the pool. And they didn't get him in. <laughs> he said, Brian Young said, I turned sideways and I just held the door on both sides and they never got me in there. <laughs> so, so they vowed that when it came his time to go into the Hall of Fame, he was going in the pool. <laughs> and they tricked him. It's, it's a pretty good story. But Brian Young, there's a picture of me on my website if we could ever show it. But anyway, he's sitting and I'm standing and we're the same height. So there's no doubt why he played in the NFL and I didn't. So, uh, fun facts, um, Robert Brazil's college roommate was uh, Walter Payton. Oh. Bobby Bethard's uh, college roommate was John Madden. Oh. And it's really interesting, they all sort of, all these guys sort of connect after a while, you know. Um, and then I did Bob Hayes. Remember Bullet Bob yeah. Hayes? Yeah. I don't have his bust here. He's the only man in history to ever win an Olympic gold medal and a Super Bowl. Wow. Mm -hmm. No, the people have won the bronze medals and Super Bowl, but not that. There's only one human ever. Okay, here's the trivia question of the night. Who was Bob Hayes' roommate in the Tokyo Olympics? And he stole his shoes the night before he ran, so he had to run in borrowed shoes. <sighs> Joe Frazier. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And that was told to me by Bob Ace's widow. So, I mean, think about that. Joe Frazier. I mean, that's pretty cool. The holidays sort of connect. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Any other, anybody have any other random questions? Before I keep rattling? <laughs> how, do they, how do they do the bus for people that are admitted? Um, after they die. You do them posthumously, and it just depends on each player. For instance, Bob Hayes had died when I did him. They told me his son was the spitting image of him. And again, if I could get this to work and it won't. Anyway, there's a picture on my website of Bob Hayes Jr. standing with me in the sculpture, and he looks a lot like him. So I used his measurements, and then I changed it to what Bob looked like. Bob had different eyelids and so forth. Bobby Dillon, I didn't have anything on him. And there was, I sat down with his daughter and we went through, I mean, snapshots, little old, you know, those little Polaroids. And I blew them all up and we found one photograph of him at the lake, turned sideways, putting a boat in the water. And so that's what I use for my profile. Because what you don't realize is when it's Christmas time and they say, show us your package, you don't do this. <laughs> so I need a profile of you know John. 
I don't have one because you never sue for one, right? So you got to have a profile if you can find it. So we use a lot of, at Christmas, people will shoot a picture from the side, open it with kids and stuff like that, and that's what you try to figure out. As far as the size, I just asked his daughter, I said, did he have a big head? Did he have a little head? And she said, oh, it's kind of big. And I was like, okay. And I used a kind of, I looked at my head, and I was like, uh, he looks kind of big, and I used his measurements. So that's how you do it. Yes, sir. Um, I was curious if, who you think of as the most deserving who's not in yet, who's maybe been overlooked, or who, or also who you would like to do the most? Well, one that was most deserving got in recently was Jimmy Johnson. We can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, come on. That's just a Drew Pearson. Drew Pearson, you know, was one that you know, need to get in too. Um, you know, I'd have to think about the, the who I'd want to do the most because being an artist, I'm looking for skull. I'm looking for structure, you know? And I mean, like, you have no idea how many times during your class I'm studying your cranium. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. There's some similarities. <laughs> but I, I'm into, it's, it's a curse, you know, I can see all these things. Okay. So for me, I want to get people who, oh, well, uh, what's the linebacker that played for the Dolphins that played for Texas Tech? Zach, Zach Thomas? Zach, Zach Thomas. Zach. That's a head I'd like to do. It looks like a block of ice with hair. You know? <laughs> I mean, his jaw. Look at these bad boys, you know. So I like doing guys that look like football players. And another thing is you don't overdo it, but you want to put a neck on these guys, okay? They didn't come in there looking like, you know, they were they're ready to go. And most of them, if you really look close, some of them have some pretty big necks. So I don't overdo it, but... You want to make sure that's healthy. And that's something else that people don't realize. You can do a perfect head, and if it's just a tube neck, it'll never look right. Mm -hmm. So everything counts. I mean, the way the neck's shaped, the way the neck goes into the shoulder pads, the curve of the shoulder pads, all that stuff. And there's all these little subtle things you want to do. So oh, go ahead. Are, are these heads all the same scale? They're all life size. So, so in, when you do a uh, sculpture, there's life size when I do them, but when you cast them, you lose about three to four percent. Mm -hmm. So they're slightly smaller. Mm -hmm. And every time you make a mold off of an original, you're going to lose three or four percent. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so the way this works, and I think it was Christian asked me, but you do these in water-based clay, and you they have to be kept moist or they'll dry out. There's a pipe inside of them, and then you keep them moist because if you don't, they'll crack. Okay, the reason for that, there's two kinds of clay, water-based and oil-based, okay? Water-based clay, you have to, it's sort of organic, you keep it wet, you keep it going. The reason we do that is they can get hot and they don't deteriorate. If you take oil-based clay, it's beautiful the way it works, but if it gets hot, even if it's not in the sun, it just melts. Okay. So we fly these things around. Now, luckily for me, since I'm a vet, there's three guys, the other two are full-time guys, they do the traveling. I mean, you know, they, they can't go chasing somebody around, you know. So, and, I, and I, I understand how that works. So, but if I do travel with them, they're in a crate. We fly them. We don't, we can't pick the crate up. It's so heavy. We have them do a forklift and the whole deal. But they can get hot on the tarmac and they don't melt. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, water-based clay, we make a mold. Then that mold then can be, have multiple things made. We make a bronze for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And that bronze is what you see on television, or like if you, any of you guys go to Brock Young's induction speech, when he pulls it off, that, that's the bronze we made. And then I make two, and these are plaster copies. And so you can see they're hollow, okay? So one of the copies I keep for myself for just having and also to talk and do all kinds of cool things. You would think that the player would get a bronze copy. They get a plaster copy. <laughs> but you put a patina on it to color it, and it looks exactly like the bronze. And if you go in their home, you couldn't tell the difference unless they dumped it over, and then it would bust like a cookie jar. Because it's ceramic, basically, or plaster. Scott, have you ever thought about sculpting your own head? <laughs> I get asked that every once in a while. Yeah, but not really. I mean, I would look, I'm looking for more interesting things. <laughs> uh, and another thing about sculpture is I'm looking for gesture, 
an expression, okay? Now, we express things with our eyelids, our eyebrows, our bridge of our nose, our mouth. You can do all these little things, and it's subtle. Just a little difference can be quizzical, it can be focused, can, so looking for that. The other thing is gesture. In sculpture, you want to you don't want to do this, you want to do this, you want to go a little over to really make it profound. Well, the Hall of Fame, they want them straight. So we cheat a little bit. If you notice some of these heads are turned just a little, that's because I can't stand to go straight. <laughs> the other thing I've learned is if I take a head and turn it just a little and then cut the eyes, it makes it look like it's moving. So his eyes are going one way, his eyes are going another, and I've tried to do that on those some players don't want it, but I think it makes it look more lifelike. Yeah. The other thing is you want to lift the chin just a little bit. You know, our heroes tend to be up and have a chin up. Now, normally I would show you these about foot to 18 inches taller because I, they're meant to look up at, but this is the tallest tough table I could find. So, but yes, um, it's not, I don't want to sculpt myself. <laughs> Zach Thomas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what other things besides NFL players would you like to sculpt? I'm, I'm, I've sculpted horses, cattle, and all kind of dogs, cats, I've done all of that. I like sports. And I like, I, it ha, I've been through this in my mind a million times. I'm a runner, so when I'm running, I'm doing all this. It has to have a purpose, okay? It has to have a place to go. So for me just to go into the studio and say, yeah, I think I'll sculpt, you know, Donnie Manziel for the Aggies, but you know, but anyway. Uh, it, that would, it has to have a home. It has to have a place to go. I also like sculpting fabric. Now, I don't mean actual fabric. I mean making folds that look real. And those are really easy to screw up. So then religious sculpture comes into mind because there's a lot of fabric and drapery. And there's the human figure. And by the way, you sculpt them basically nude so that all the parts are right, and then you drape the fabric over them, and you make sure the fabric hangs properly so it looks real. And you know, there's all that art to doing all that. So I wouldn't mind doing religious sculpture as well. But so when I was a little kid, I was like the worst little boy ever. And so to keep me out of trouble, they would get a piece of paper and a pencil, and they'd say, "Okay, you make us a construction site with three tall buildings and 20 men." Good after it. <laughs> Three, four hours later, I was still doing it. You know, and there was men underground, and men, so I liked the assignment. Well, that's what this is. You get the assignment, and it didn't dawn on me until years later. It used to be we would get a, you know, knock on the door, a doorbell, go out, and there was a FedEx package, and it had a disc in it and a set of measurements. And I'd tell Kathy, I'm like, hey, I'm sculpting so and so this year, you know, because I'd rip it open. And I always felt like, you remember Mission Impossible? It said, this mission, should you choose to accept it? You know, that's how it felt when I opened the package. So I like the idea of being assigned to honor someone. So you say, what would I like to do? I'd like for somebody to have someone worthy of being sculpted, a Bryant Young, for instance, and someone who's a good person, and then try to really, really give them what they deserve. And what makes it even better about him is Brian, he's not a showboat. He was just a good dude. And for a good guy who did his job and showed up, and you know, they had that thing of we, not me, the whole thing. He was the best teammate ever. That's what I like. Somebody who's worthy of it. And then I can go out and pour everything I have into honoring that cause. That's what it is for me. What's the largest one you've ever done? Uh, I did, uh, let's see, I did it one and a half times life size white tail bucking though. Yeah, it was, it's in Toler, Texas, as a matter of fact. So I got to building it, and you put it on a stage with wheels so you can turn them around and move them. Well, I got to the top, and I was like, oh, darn, and I ran out of room in the studio. Oh, <laughs> so I had to take the acoustic tiles out and some of the oh, animals and yeah. went up in there, and the tail, too. So I just I couldn't really move the stage at that point. Oh. Yeah, and I was, you know, when you go through Acton, um, there's, there used to be the... All those of us have been around here a long time, the acting triangle, you know, because they got rid of it now. But there's that little area where the donut shop is. I used to have a studio Which there. There's like four. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, well, yeah. What that little place right there facing out is where my studio used to be. Okay. And I would sculpt late at night, and I got more crazy people that would show up. What's going on? And they're like, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> I used to, that's where I sculpted those deer. 
So do you have to reinforce those when they get that big? Yes, you, yeah. you build, first of all, you do a small one, and then you, it's called a maquette, and that small one's where you work out all your problems. And then you, you know, you, I, I did it by hand back then, now I'd probably photograph it and measure through the photograph, but back then I redrew it, and I had a, another stage built, and then a big, huge pipe welded, and I had a, like a C-clamp looking thing, or U-bolt, whatever, and I put two by 12s in it, screwed it together, yeah. covered it with styrofoam, yeah. and then after the styrofoam, covered it in foam with legs and built it from there. Yeah, it. Yeah. it took a long time just to get it covered in clay. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you see overlaps in your art, your sculpting, and your meditations? Every day, every day. So, First of all, the anatomy. You know, it's the same anatomy, it's just elongated or shortened or whatever. But the, the biggest one is, um, so these measurements, you know, where's the bottom of the ear hole? I mean, like, eh, you know, you kind of try to figure the bottom of the ear hole to the side of the nose, and then to the tip of the nose, and to the corner of the mouth, and all that. Well, there's a surgery we do called the TPLO, and it's a tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. And you cut the tibia, and you turn the bone, and then you screw it together, and I'll just, well, you use calipers. So I got these little baby calipers for dog legs, and then I have these big calipers for this, and it's the same thing. And, and it's crazy, because it's, it's all about getting the measurements right. The other thing is, these heads have to square up. You know, you can't have a head that's not right on both sides of the face, you know? Or it has to have, you know, it has to be centered. So when you're looking at a leg, you put that leg back together, and you cut it in half, if you put it together crooked, well, you're not going to walk very good. So the same sort of idea, to look at that leg afterwards and screw it together. You've got, so it's, it's it's all the same to me. Because I, I guess for me, he spent my bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess for me, when you're talking about honoring and, and that emotional side of it, that what you do for us, when we bring our pets to you, and they're really our furry children. I hope you know how much that means to us, and especially when it's in times. Well, thank you, and, me, and you need to know what you mean to me. You know, it's a two-way street. So I'm gonna see if I can't forget to tell you some things. First of all, when you do a sculpture, if it doesn't look like them, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, if it doesn't look like them, you're, what's the point? You've got to get a likeness. After a likeness, then you want to get an expression. And, you know, do you want mad? Do you want discipline? Do you want focus? Do you want whimsy? You know, whatever you, what do you want. So you get it, you've got to get an exact likeness. And then you've got to move those eyebrows and cheeks around and stuff to get the expression. And then, I don't know how to put it in writing or in, I know how to try to put it in sculpture, but that spirit inside of something. It's in there, okay? And each and every one of you that I know has a different something in you. I, I just know you from meeting you and talking to you. And I do feel like if I can know you when I sculpt you, then I can try to bring that out. And you say, well, how in the heck do you do that? The way you hold your head, the way you tilt your shoulders, the way you keep one eyebrow up and one down. I mean, it's, it, it's all in there. Okay, now the one thing we haven't talked about very much yet is aging back, okay? Uh, yeah. And the, my teacher told me, he said, it's in there, that man, that young man's in there, you just gotta find him. And you think about it, look at your pictures now and look at your pictures when you were 20, okay? All of these bones are the same, they didn't change much at all. All these bones around your eyes, the bridge of your nose is the same, your cheekbones are pretty much the same. The wrinkles are good. The wrinkles are good. <laughs> <laughs> when we're young, we're fuller up here, and we're more narrow here. And as we get older, we get more narrow here and we get fuller here. <laughs> so you change that dynamic. But it's in there. And that's that's the hard part, is to take that person. See, I'm working with older men. And I take an 86-year-old man and make him 30. Well, you and Hollywood's the best at knowing how to do all this stuff. But in, So there's lots of things. The distance between the bottom of your nose and your lip gets longer as you get older. So you pull that up. Your lips get thinner, and even if you're a man, you make your lips more full. These are all youthful things, which all you gotta do is watch the TV channel and then not for ladies, and they show you all this stuff. <laughs> Hair, 
the, the, the hairline comes down, and a lot of things like that. So there's all these subtle things, and you just work and you work and you work, and finally after a while you're like, okay, that's starting to look younger. But it's not one thing, it's a whole bunch of little things. Yes, sir? Where, where I sit, you only got one happy guy up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which one is it? Oh, Charlie. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so so let me. That's there's all these things I want to talk about. So, teeth. When we smile, a lot of players will smile and their mouths open. Go to Europe. Go to Michelangelo's work, greatest ever. There's no teeth showing. So I I always say, you know, I mean, if a guy wants teeth, I'll, I'll try to get him to smile with his mouth partially open, <laughs> but I just try to help them. I want them to have a piece of heart, too, and, and that's hard to do with, with the teeth. So, Drew, go ahead. So, this, the bronzing process, is that done somewhere in the States, and do you go watch it be done? And <laughs> So, I used to do it in Arlington, uh -huh. and then I did it in Reno, which is right outside of Boyd, and you know how it goes. The guy sells a foundry, the guy that buys it doesn't do as good work, whatever. Long story short, the metal in Texas, the way they handle the metal, where they weld it, I didn't really like what was happening with it. I was getting some problems. Uh, the other thing is they can make a mold where the mold opens up underneath the bottom, which is preferred, but that's harder for them. So they want to cut a hole in the back of the head. Well, that's easy for them. The problem is we got to retexture all that hair. And I'll just be, I'll take the high road and just tell you that I wasn't happy with any of the Texas people. The other two sculptors live in Utah and they live very close to each other and they're the number one and two sculptors for this whole foundry. So I just piggyback on their success and I take my mold made in Texas and ship it to Utah. They're all cast at the same time. Now the big thing was the patina. The patina is the color. And I worked like a son of a gun for years trying to match my patina to their, theirs. Okay, it's Utah in May, and it's what, 31% relative humidity, maybe? And here it's 89% relative humidity. It's 104 here, and it's 76 there. It never looked the same. So um, I guess it was, what year did we do Chris Hamburger? Like 2011 or 9, whatever year that was. We finally cast one in Texas and shipped it to Utah for the patina. And it was beautiful. And I said, well, we're never doing that again. We're going to let them do it. Well, then it turned in, it was like, well, heck, if they're going to patina them, let's let them cast it too. So off we went. And it really helps me from a quality standpoint, but it also helps me because once that head leaves, I'm done, which is, I have a full-time job. So it helps a lot. And yes, I used to, listen to this one, I used to cast it in Reno but then the metal was welded together in outside of Red Oak, okay, which is way on the other side of you know, Dallas. Or, and then we had to put the patina. It was, it was a nightmare. So a lot less driving. But I used to watch every step of the way. And what we were getting was when Kevin Green was cast, there was a big rip through his eye. And we fixed it, and he, it's in the Hall of Fame, you know, but it took me a lot of time. And sculpting with clay is easy. Sculpting with a metal grinder, <laughs> not easy. And you could, I had, it took me forever to add clay, I mean add clay, add solder, grind it back, smooth it, add more. It, it was, and I'm, well, when I go to heaven, they're going to be like, oh, well, it's cuss words. I hate to that crap right there. Trust me, man. So, it's, they, it's much better now. Now, a couple of years, uh, 2019 and 2018, I made the heads 90% finished, put them in their crate, shipped them to Utah, and then I flew to Utah, and I was in one of this guy's studios, and I finished them there. And it was really cool, because we were all together, it was a camaraderie deal, you know, and then when I was through, I literally just took and rolled it right into the mold room, it was like, see you later, and they just made the mold, and off I went. They also, not only do they use better work, it's cheaper, I know. So that's not the like. So yes, it's all done in Utah now. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, no, you're. Okay. Uh, you shared a story with us about one of your candidates that you were discussing was very resistant about coming in for his final measurements and and the problems you had getting him here. 
Can you maybe ever tell us about that? I've told so many of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ricky Jackson, I guess, is the one I'm... I don't know. I just thought it was so funny the way you finally... Well, came. so Ricky Jackson, is he played for the um, New Orleans Saints. Y'all you know, remember the Dome Patrol? Mm -hmm. And I kept talking to him uh, about coming to Texas, and he, he didn't understand. I was like, I got to get you to, you know, to come here and let me see you. And so long story short, he was going to go to LA afterwards and we had to buy him a ticket to fly from somewhere in Louisiana to Dallas. And then we had to buy him another ticket to get him to LA. And so I just, okay, we did it. And this is, I need a volunteer. Yes, sir, that's great. Come be my volunteer, sir. <laughs> okay, so you're sculpting and I'm Ricky Jackson, okay? So when you sculpt the head, if I, if you, if I'm turned this way, the bus has to be turned this way, right? Can you do the same? So if you turn this way, the bus turns. So I set Ricky up. You're the sculptor. So start sculpting right here. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, so I would turn, I would turn and turn the sculpture, and he would get lined up. Go ahead and start sculpting. Yeah. Okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> So I was um, a kid and I rodeo, and I was a calf roper and a ribbon roper and a team roper and all that stuff. And I was an artist, and so I went, and I was the president of the National Honor Society. So I went to the counselor and sat down, and he's like, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I do art. And he goes, cowboy artist. Said, yes, sir. He's like, okay. So let's look at the list. And he goes down the list, and he got to the bottom, and he goes, veterinarian. They work with horses. And I said, that sounds good. And that was it. I said, I'm not kidding you. If you all read, if you heard of an author, I'm sure John has, Ben K. Green, Cowtails, Wild More Cowtails, unbelievably good books. And at the same time, James Harriet came out with his own. So between Ben K. Green, which was basically a Texas James Harriet, and then James Harriet, the famous English veterinarian. I mean, my head was filled with all this romantic veterinary stuff. I had to be a horse doctor. <laughs> <laughs> when I got out of AM, that's what I wanted to be was a horse doctor. And did horses for a long time. It just is a tough, tough, tough lifestyle. I mean, it's 24 7, 365. It's, it's a lot of work. So I do dogs and cats now. <laughs> all right, I, I, are we running on time? We're getting close. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> so, I need to share. I need to share this with you. So, I really love being a veterinarian. But when somebody calls you and says, "Hey, how about the best gig ever from sculpture?" You know, it gets you pretty excited. And that was 2003. So I, boy, I gave it everything I had, and I thought it turned out pretty good. You know, the other artists came and went, and for whatever reason, they didn't stay with the program. I got another call with Rayfield, and I got to stick. And so it's been two or one or two every year. And I was just like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. And, and of course, my mind, I'm going to do work for the Baseball Hall of Fame and the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And uh, then I'm going to go do Kobe Bryant. You know, you know how it goes. And, you, and if you have a certain amount of discipline and will, you can make stuff happen. And it seemed like every time I went down that sculpture path, there was a, a roadblock. It was interesting. And during that time, I sold the vet practice, and I worked three days a week, and then I sculpted and painted the rest of the time. And it was the weirdest deal. I mean, I worked hard at being a sculptor and a painter, and I had success. I mean, I was in galleries, and it did great, but I kept liking veterinary medicine more and more and more. And so I did the art in the veterinary medicine, and there were career paths that were just even, and they were, and they were doing great. And I just kept thinking, this sculpture thing is great. I love doing it, but it's, it's, it's a real challenge to make, you know, you can do a $100,000 sculpture, but then you may go three years without another one. And you divide 100,000 by three years, that's $33,000. <laughs> it's a tough way to make a living. Veterinary medicine kept going. Well, then I met these other doctors, 
And they were talking about buying the vet practice. So I thought, this is crazy. I think I'll buy that practice back with these guys. And literally, I'm in my studio one afternoon, and it was, I mean, I just like, and it's like God said, this is not what I had planned for you, buddy. This is not what you need to be, you're not going to be sitting here all quiet, you know. You need to get back into it. And I was like, oh. So it was shortly after that. I, in a heart attack. You know, that, I, had, I, had, I, had, I didn't have a heart attack, but I almost had one. I missed it by a few minutes. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that's another story. But I bought the practice back with two other doctors. And I realized that, you know, God's will, you got to be listening. Okay, and I'm going to be the world's most famous veterinary sculptor. <laughs> and, and my daughter, our daughter Mallory, is really proud of me, but she always tells the, says, says the same thing to people. Yeah, my dad's a veterinarian and a sculptor for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> and it is weird, but it's my life. And I realized that that's what God wants me to do. And I, the thing is, I need to make sure I tell you all this. Is I don't really know why. I don't. I mean, I love doing it, and I gotta tell you, if somebody called me today and said we want you to do a you know, nine foot Shaquille O'Neal, I'd be like, I gotta take time off from the clinic. You know? <laughs> and that's how I'm wired now. Is I like my job so much. I like the people I work with so much. That's what I when I think I'm doing what God wants me to do. So you have to, what Mary's going, but what she said means the world to me, and tells me that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That having been said, every year when I get a call, like my March, April, and May is pretty much wrecked. But that's okay. That's another thing God wants me to do. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but sometimes you, you almost have to just quit fighting and just give in to what the flow, you know? Yeah. So it, took me, it only took me 20 something years of doing it. That's my story. <laughs> Thank you.